December 15th, McMurdo Station, Antarctica. A Boeing C-17 Globemaster III is three hours from landing on a runway that will cease to exist in six weeks. The runway is eight feet of frozen ocean, no asphalt, no concrete, just ice groomed flat across two miles of sea that by late January will be open water. The aircraft weighs 280 tons. The surface it will land on has the friction properties of a skating rink. The crew has already crossed their point of no return. The fuel threshold beyond which turning back is mathematically impossible. The only option is landing. How do you land a plane on a surface that offers almost no friction? How do you stop 280 tons when your wheels can barely grip? And what happens when your eyes stop working, when the horizon disappears and your brain can no longer tell up from down? This is how pilots land on the hardest runway on the planet. The sea ice runway at McMurdo is rebuilt every year. It does not exist as permanent infrastructure. It is a seasonal construct with a life cycle, birth in late winter, a working life of weeks, and an inevitable death as the Antarctic summer progresses. Construction begins when the sea ice reaches sufficient thickness. A survey team ventures onto the frozen ocean with ground-penetrating radar and drilling equipment. They are searching for a section of ice at least eight feet thick, the minimum required to support the weight of a C-17. They also look for an area free of large cracks or pressure ridges, which indicate instability. Once a suitable site is identified, it is flagged to mark a runway 10,000 feet long and 200 feet wide. Heavy vehicles then begin the process of grooming. They scrape away the top layer of snow, which acts as insulation to expose the hard blue sea ice beneath. Graders and groomers level the surface to within inches of perfect flatness. Any cracks are filled with a slurry of water and snow that freezes solid. The final surface is often given a light corduroy texture to improve braking friction. This runway is not static. It moves with the ocean tides and currents beneath it. As the summer progresses and the sun circles the sky for 24 hours a day, the ice begins to weaken. Melt pools form. Seals haul out onto the surface. By late December or early January, the runway is declared too unstable for further operations. The ice that took weeks to prepare will be open water within months. The impermanence is not a flaw, it is the operating condition. Every landing happens on a platform with an expiration date. The C-17 Globemaster III can land on ice because of three systems that work in a precise sequence. Understanding these systems is necessary before understanding how they are used. The first system is the thrust reverser. Each of the four engines is equipped with large clamshell doors. When activated, these doors redirect the engine's exhaust forward instead of backward. This creates a powerful braking force, up to 40% of the total stopping power that is independent of the runway's friction. The reversers do not rely on the wheels gripping the ice. They use the engine's own thrust to slow the aircraft. The second system is the spoilers. These are panels on the top of the wings. When deployed, they disrupt the airflow over the wing, eliminating lift. This dumps the aircraft's weight onto the landing gear. Without spoilers, the wings would continue generating lift even after touchdown, keeping weight off the wheels and reducing the effectiveness of braking. The third system is anti-skid braking. It functions like an advanced ABS system in a car. Sensors on each wheel detect when a wheel is about to lock up and skid. The system reduces brake pressure to that wheel, allowing it to continue rotating. A locked, skidding wheel has almost no directional control and very poor braking effectiveness. The anti-skid system allows the pilot to apply maximum braking force without losing control. These three systems must work together. On a surface with minimal friction, wheel braking alone would cause the aircraft to slide uncontrollably. The reversers provide the primary stopping force. The spoilers ensure the aircraft's weight is on the wheels. The anti-skid prevents lockup. The sequence matters. Chapter 3. The Fuel Math That Ends Options Every flight to a deep field location in Antarctica includes a calculation called the point of safe return. It is the moment in the flight where the aircraft no longer has enough fuel to turn around and return to its departure point. The calculation is straightforward. It accounts for fuel burn rate, distance remaining to the destination, distance back to the departure airfield, and required fuel reserves. The result is a specific geographic point 
often hundreds of miles from the destination, beyond which return is no longer possible. Once the aircraft crosses this threshold, the crew is committed. Weather reports indicating deteriorating conditions at the destination become advisory, not actionable. Runway condition reports showing poor braking action are noted but do not change the plan. The only option is to continue to the destination and land. This irreversibility changes the nature of decision-making. Pilots are trained to always have an out, an alternate plan, a diversion airfield, a way to abort. Beyond the point of no return, those options disappear. The fuel math has removed them. The psychological weight of this is significant. The crew knows, hours before they arrive, that they will land regardless of what they find. The commitment is made not when the wheels touch the ice, but when the aircraft crosses an invisible line in the sky, still far from the destination. In normal flying conditions, a pilot relies on visual cues to orient the aircraft. The horizon provides a reference for level flight. The ground provides a sense of altitude and closure rate. Shadows and textures give depth perception. In Antarctica, these cues can vanish completely. A whiteout occurs when there is an overcast cloud layer above and a snow-covered surface below. The light becomes so diffused that all shadows disappear. The horizon is no longer visible. There is no distinction between the sky and the ground, just a seamless, uniform white in every direction. Pilots describe it as flying inside a bottle of milk. Without a horizon, the human brain cannot determine orientation. Up and down become indistinguishable. Vertigo can set in rapidly. The inner ear, which normally helps with balance, provides no useful information in the absence of visual reference. The pilot's senses, millions of years of evolution, are now feeding false information. Flat light is a different but equally dangerous phenomenon. It can occur even on a clear day when the sun is at a certain angle. The reflection off the snow eliminates all surface texture. A pilot might see the mountains in the distance and the sky above, but the snow surface directly ahead becomes a featureless white void. There is no way to judge altitude above the runway. A pilot might believe they are 50 feet up when they are only 10, or they might fly into a rising snowdrift they cannot see. In these conditions, pilots must transition to pure instrument flight. The gauges on the instrument panel become reality. The view out of the window becomes noise. Vision, which is normally the primary sense for flying, must be suppressed. The pilot must trust the instruments over what they see or think they see. Catabatic winds are not ordinary winds. They are gravity-driven flows of super-dense, super-cold air. The process begins on the high Antarctic plateau. The air cools and becomes denser than the surrounding atmosphere. Gravity pulls this heavy air downhill toward the coast. As it flows through valleys and over ice shelves, it accelerates. Wind speeds regularly exceed 100 miles per hour. In some locations, they can reach hurricane force. These winds are notoriously unpredictable. They can materialize from calm conditions in a matter of minutes. For an aircraft on final approach, flying slowly with limited energy reserves, a catabatic wind represents an extreme crosswind or wind shear event. A sudden gust from the side can push the aircraft off the runway centerline. A rapid change in wind speed or direction can cause a sudden loss of lift. At low altitude, with little room to recover, this is a critical threat. Weather forecasters on the ground monitor wind conditions constantly. They provide real-time updates to incoming aircraft. The crew receives wind speed, direction, and any signs of building catabatic flow. But the predictive window is short. The wind can change during the final approach, during the phase of flight when the aircraft is most vulnerable and when options are most limited. The final approach to an Antarctic ice runway is flown almost entirely on instruments. The crew uses a GPS-based approach that provides precise lateral and vertical guidance to the runway threshold. The pilot flying focuses on keeping the aircraft aligned with the digital course indicators on the flight display. The pilot monitoring cross-checks the instruments and verbalizes every parameter. Altitude, airspeed, descent rate, heading. Any deviation from the expected values is called out immediately. Every action in the cockpit is verbalized. Gear down, three green, Flaps 30, 1,000 feet, stable. This constant dialogue is not procedural theater. It builds a shared mental model between the two pilots. 
In conditions where sensory input is unreliable or conflicting, the structure of language ensures that both crew members understand the aircraft's state. The C-17 is equipped with a head-up display, or HUD. This is a transparent screen positioned in the pilot's forward line of sight. It projects critical flight information, airspeed, altitude, descent rate, course alignment onto the screen. The pilot can monitor these parameters while looking forward without having to glance down at the instrument panel. The HUD is essential in whiteout or flat light conditions. When looking outside provides no useful information, the HUD allows the pilot to maintain the instrument scan while still looking in the direction of the runway. The pilot is not looking at the ice. They are looking at the data that tells them where the ice is. The approach is stable or it is not. There is no improvisation. The crew flies the numbers. The landing technique for the C-17 on ice is counterintuitive. The pilot does not aim for a soft, gentle touchdown. The goal is a firm, positive landing. The reason is mechanical. The aircraft's systems, spoilers, anti-skid braking are activated by weight-on-wheels sensors in the landing gear. These sensors require a certain amount of force to trigger. A soft landing might not generate enough force to activate the sensors immediately. A firm landing ensures the systems engage the moment the wheels contact the ice. The instant the wheels touch down, the spoilers deploy. Panels on the wings rise up, disrupting the airflow and dumping all lift. The aircraft's full weight transfers to the landing gear. Simultaneously, the thrust reversers engage. The massive clamshell doors on each engine swing open, redirecting the jet exhaust forward. The aircraft is now using its own engine thrust to slow itself down. This is the primary braking force on ice. It does not depend on the wheels gripping the surface. Only after the spoilers and reversers are engaged does the pilot begin applying wheel braking. The pressure is gentle and metered. The anti-skid system monitors each wheel. If a wheel begins to skid, the system reduces brake pressure to that wheel, allowing it to continue rotating. The pilot must find the edge of the skid, applying just enough braking force to slow the aircraft without locking the wheels. Too much pressure and the wheels lock. A locked wheel on ice means loss of directional control. The aircraft would slide rather than roll. The braking roll is long often more than 10,000 feet, sometimes 12,000, over two miles. The speed bleeds away slowly. The crew watches the airspeed indicator tick down. 150 knots, 100 knots, 50 knots. Finally, taxi speed. The landing is not complete when the wheels touch the ice. It is complete when the aircraft stops. The ambient temperature on an Antarctic ice runway is routinely below minus 50 degrees Celsius. At this temperature, materials behave differently. Hydraulic fluids thicken. The fluid that operates the aircraft's flight controls, landing gear, and brakes becomes sluggish. Response times slow. A control input that would normally be immediate now takes longer to execute. Metal becomes brittle. The risk of stress fractures increases. Components that would normally flex under load may crack instead. Before an aircraft can be started after sitting on the ice, it must be preheated. Heaters are attached to the engines and critical systems for hours. Without this preheating, attempting to start the engines could cause damage. The ground crew works in this environment. They wear extreme cold weather gear, multiple layers, insulated boots, heavy gloves. The gear is bulky and restricts movement. Every task takes longer. Refueling the aircraft, guiding it into position, conducting the pre-flight inspection. Exposed skin can suffer frostbite in under a minute. A technician cannot hold a metal tool with bare hands without risking immediate injury. The simple act of performing maintenance becomes a carefully managed risk. The aircraft itself becomes less reliable as the temperature drops. Systems that function normally in warmer climates now operate at the edge of their design limits. The cold is not just uncomfortable, it degrades performance. It introduces failure modes that do not exist elsewhere. This is the operational environment. It exists before the flight, during the flight, and after the flight. The cold does not relent. It is the constant that shapes every decision, every procedure, and every risk calculation. The runway is made of ice that will melt. The aircraft must stop on a surface that offers almost no friction. The crew flies through conditions where their eyes provide no useful information. The winds can appear in minutes. The cold breaks machines and threatens humans. And still, the landings happen. 
not because the risks are small, but because the systems, the training, and the discipline are precise enough to manage them. There are places on Earth where the margin between success and failure is measured in seconds, in feet, in the exact sequence of a procedure. Antarctica is one of them. The pilots who land there do not work in forgiving conditions. They work in conditions that have been made survivable through engineering, preparation, and the kind of focus that leaves no room for improvisation. Every landing on an Antarctic ice runway represents hundreds of hours of training, thousands of hours of maintenance, and decades of refining procedures that turn an impossible task into a repeatable one. The risks do not disappear. They are accounted for, managed, and respected. This is not routine. It is controlled. There is a difference.